Oh, it's good to see you all. And I know it's not everybody. I know that uh, some people are, are needing to be home, but I'm glad to see you all. Uh, very rarely have I seen a few of you uh, during these last 12 weeks, but I'm sure, sure glad to be here with you. Um, this is all sort of experimental again, um, finding a way to make it work. Uh, all your bulletins have uh, all the information you should need for the service, all the words for the songs are in there, all the other words that we need. Um, maybe you saw as you were approaching that uh, there are two boxes on stands that are in uh, plaid, black and white plaid. Those are the offering containers. So we don't have to pass offering plates. Um, you can put your offering there um, on the way in, the way out, or any time. When it comes to communion distribution today, I'll say it now at the beginning, but I'll, we'll do it in a little explanation later. We're going to come to you. Uh, you will stay seated where you are. The communion distribution will be um, these, these little self-contained containers that have both the wine and the bread wafer in them. and. As uh, Larry and I come out and distribute to you, then we're advising that you don't eat on your own, but that we all eat at one time together. So the advice that we're going to give is to maybe just peel open the very top uh, layer slightly that has the bread in, not to keep it flying out and floating in the grass. Hopefully that won't happen. Um, so being safe that way. And then after everybody has been distributed to, even those that may be in their vehicles, then we will, uh, I'll come back to the, to the center here, and we will uh, share the meal together, which is a very different way of communing than we're usually doing it, but it is a very wonderful way to commune, to kind of have a sense that we're all eating at the same time and sharing in the holy meal together. So... Hopefully good enough explanation of that. Um, we are hoping that this experimentation is, uh, we're no worse for wear in doing this. We're trying to record today as well. So hopefully we'll have a successful recording that can still be uh, put out there uh, for uh, people that weren't able to make it today to um, see it um, on our regular YouTube channel. Larry's hoping for that too, right Larry? <laughs> We're all hoping for that. All right. Since we haven't had many activities and we don't have many announcements of activities upcoming up, there's a, there's a couple things listed in the back page of the bulletin. But otherwise than that, um, we're going to have a song leader today because we're a little spread out and it's harder to hear each other sing and we're not in the building with the walls um, uh, reverberating back to us. So I asked my daughter, Carissa, if she would give us a little vocal backup as a group to sing. Maybe I'll keep my mic on too. And just, I'll slide it back a little further away from my mouth so I'm not blasting loud. And, uh, and we'll sing together. So, I was thinking that maybe we'd feel comfortable standing, but I don't know if you feel comfortable standing in an outdoor setting like this. But, um, the peace of the Lord be with you always. If you want to stand for the song, you may. It's going to be the beautiful Savior, followed by a second hymn, Now All the Vault of Heaven Resounds. No, it's not loud enough. There we go.
It's okay. We have to readjust the clothespins, so to speak, so the music doesn't blow everywhere. It takes a little finagling, a little extra effort. Not the quick page turn like usual. <laughs> Let us pray. Oh, gracious Lord, we are so joyful and glad and happy to be gathered together in your presence. Together, some of us here, together others that we are connecting with remotely and who will watch this recording later. Lord, the body of Christ is your making. It is your work in us. Um, we love to gather inside a church building. We love to gather outside a church building. We can be gathered even in our homes, but Lord, the body of Christ is meant to see each other and connect with each other. That's the best possible scenario. And we've been missing that, and so glad to see some of the body of Christ here today. We ask, Lord, that our worship be a joyful worship, that this time together be a wonderful time together, that your word works upon us, that it gives us new life on each day that it gives us great joy in hearing the promises and the knowledge of our forgiveness of sins, that it hears us great joy to hear your word proclaimed. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
You may be seated if you're standing. Scripture reading. Is this mic on? It's on. You're going to have to project. <laughs> the first reading comes from Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through chapter 2, 4a. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, Let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. God called the vault sky. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, Let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seeds according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it, according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. And let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, Let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God, so God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing with which the water teems and that moves about in it, according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its, guy, its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful, and increase in number, and fill the water in the seas, and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So, on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it 
he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they are created. We're now going to read Psalm 8 responsively. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise, praise of, of children, children and infants, you have established, established a stronghold against, against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what, what is, is mankind that you, that you are mindful of them? human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. All flocks and herds and the animals of the wild. The birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic, majestic is, is your name in all, in all the earth. earth. The second reading comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning in verse 11. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All God's people here send their greetings. Here ends the reading. gospel today is in Matthew chapter 28 verses 16 through 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him they worshiped him but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Go ahead and be seated. So what a very big difference color makes in our lives. How many of you grew up watching television in black and white? Yeah, there are some of us here. I watch television shows like Leave it to Beaver, Lassie, Maverick, Gilligan's Island. I watched NFL football games with the Vikings and the Packers and the Chicago Bears and who I, I don't even know all the ones I watched back in the day. I watched the astronauts land on the moon. In fact, that was my first television viewing of my life. Three years old. I remember all of those in black and white. All through the 60s, into the 70s. And then late, late in the 70s, we got a color television behind the times of many of our neighbors. But And when we got a color television, that drab, bland, black and white TV not very crisp, that all kind of brilliantly changed. We had all those brilliant colors, red and yellow, green, blue, and all the shades, and it was all very alive and fresh and vivid to me. And do you know that the, the entertainment genius Walt Disney was a, a, a breaker in of color television. He had been working with ABC television from its very beginnings, 
And then in 1961, color television first came out. I don't know how many people had it, but they were broadcasting it on NBC. And Walt Disney switched his allegiance from ABC to NBC. And in NBC, he now changed the title of his show to Walt Disney's Wonderful World of Color. Some of you might remember that, 1961. I was not born yet. But what a transformation color makes when we think of the transformation from shades, white and black and gray, to living color. In Matthew chapter 28, these verses, 16 through 20, it's all entitled, in my Bible and many of your Bibles, the Great Commission. Jesus called his disciples to go to a mountain in Galilee, probably not so much a mountain, but the, the elevated foothills coming off the, the Lake of Galilee, probably near the village of Capernaum, the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. And there, just before he ascends into heaven, he gives final words to his disciples. He tells them, following me means also making disciples, and doing that you will transform the world. And they did. Christian pastor and author Max Licato says the first century Christians, he said about them, not only did that movement succeed, but it far surpassed any movement in world history. Within 30 years, the message of Jesus Christ had entered every port, every city, every courtyard of that region of the world. It was infectious. It was a moving organism. People actually died to see it continue. These first century followers were transformed by the love of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit, they went out and they made disciples for Jesus. They went out and they transformed the world from black and white into living color. Have you ever wondered how were those disciples so successful? I think it was actually remarkably simple. So simple that sometimes today people don't do it, they neglect doing it because it's, it's not a big enough assignment or big enough of an ask of them. But people sometimes today look at that from a perspective that it's not all that challenging in our society to be a Christian. Mostly we are accepted culturally, only persecuted in a few spots in the world. But at the time of the first century, it was simple, but it was quite risky. When the di disciples first started making more disciples of Jesus, there was a lot of risk. They could be arrested. They could be thrown in jail. They could even be executed. Jesus only asked three things of his disciples, his followers. The first, he said, is to love God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength. And the second, he said, was to love your neighbor as yourself. And then, as recorded in Matthew 28, go and make disciples. These were the final words of Jesus, the ultimate words of Jesus. Go and make disciples. The, that makes them ultimately very important. Comparing then to now, I notice that Jesus did not command us to go and find a comfortable church, a church that meets all your needs of making friends. Jesus didn't say go and build a church that doesn't change and adapt at all for thousands of years or even hundreds of years. Jesus also did not command that Christians should make a goal of being nice people who do nice things for other people. What Jesus did command us with those last words were to go and make disciples. When we look across the world, when we look at the status of Christianity, we find that in certain parts of the world, like Western Europe and the United States and Canada, all seem to be pushing the importance of Christianity away from the center of society and more to the outside. And in those parts of the world, some, some of those places, we're not seeing a lot of discipleship making happening. In fairly recent history, I'm proud to be a part of a Lutheran association called Lutheran Congregations in Mission for Christ that has existed for 19 years that puts the name in Mission for Christ, this mission that Jesus sent us on to go and make disciples at the center. That's the core of the message. Jesus Christ is Savior. 
We are to go and make disciples by being his disciples. And I'm also glad to know of other Christian groups and denominations and church groups that make disciple making central to their existence as well. The one thing Jesus was not about was not about creating a religion. Unfortunately, though, some people still label Christianity a religion. I'll try to explain what that means. A religion is a created set of rules that ought to be followed in order to come closer to God by the achievement of closely following the rules. And that happens in many different religions where they believe that if they follow closely the set of rules, they will get closer to God. Jesus himself was Jewish. Jews were part of a religion. The Jewish religion was a reaction of the people of God who had had close encounters with God, like Abraham and Moses and Isaiah, and how God inspired these prophets to communicate God's desire to both love and save people, and also communicate God's displeasure with selfish behaviors, and people who broke God's many commandments, and through behaviors that put the self in the place of God, idolizing self, trusting things over the God of the universe. But Jesus was not just a Jew. But Jesus was God with skin on. And those who met Jesus, especially those few who lived and traveled with Jesus, had these highly personal encounters with God during those 33 years of his life in that one very small area of the world that we know today as Israel and Jordan. And as Jesus walked with them and talked with them, ate with them, communed with them, Jesus gave two commands to these 12 disciples. I mentioned them already. These, is, these are the things he wanted his followers to do. He instructed them to love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and to love your neighbors as yourself. And then 40 days after his resurrection, these last words of his teaching that he gave to the disciples were to go and make disciples and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you and to baptize them in the name of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus wanted us to be in a relationship with him and not in a religion. And to have Jesus at the very center of our relationship with him means to submit our will to him. To realize that we need to have humility, to have a humble attitude, to acknowledge that we are imperfect people who are not capable of enough obedience, enough good deeds to make ourselves closer to God or right with God. And so whether we do it symbolically falling to our knees or whether we actually fall to our knees at the feet of Jesus, we are there to submit to him, to worship the holy God, the one and only Savior, the one who redeems our lives, who gives us the gifts of life and salvation and eternal life. And that's kind of the basics of the relationship with Jesus, isn't it? That's not the complete description, but that's the basics. And Jesus wants many more people to come to know and trust him as their Savior. Jesus wants disciples to teach and share Jesus' gifts and then to go and make more disciples. It's not a great suggestion. It's the Great Commission. And there are three things that I have found that can help us remember being a disciple and help us to make more disciples. One of those things is that all authority is given to Jesus. He said it right there. All authority in heaven and earth is given to me. It's given to Jesus, not to us. Jesus is God. Jesus is the one and only. Jesus taught with authority. Jesus healed with authority. Jesus forgave sins by authority because he had the authority, because he was God. We belong to Jesus. He doesn't belong to us. This is not our church. It belongs to Jesus. This is not our mission. It is 
his mission and he invites us to be workers, to be his followers, to be workers in the vineyard with him. This has always been about a relationship with Jesus. If it's not about relationship with Jesus, it's sort of a human club and human propaganda and human rules. Second thing to remember, we are to make disciples, not converts. God is the one that converts people to faith. Jesus converts. The Holy Spirit converts. The conversion is the work of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit upon the human soul and heart and mind. What we can do is we can be witnesses. To be witnesses is to, to share about the work of Jesus in our life. We can take on that responsibility that Jesus has given us to love one another, to care, to encourage, to nurture, and sometimes, if necessary, to rebuke. But we humans are all on this journey together where we can be followers, disciples, who train and coach other followers. We are part of the great commission of Jesus, not the great suggestion. Third thing to remember, we are disciples we are not dominators. We minister and we coach to others from a position of humility. Jesus works his strength through our human weaknesses. That is where our acknowledging our own vulnerability, our own broken lives, it's helpful. Out of gratitude and love for the Savior Jesus, we try to live lives that love and serve our neighbors all our neighbors, all of us passengers on this third rock from the sun, none of us superior, all of us amateurs, all with fears and weaknesses and the great ability to mess things up. I've watched the news reports this week. I've read the newspaper accounts and seen things that I've read online about the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis about the demonstrations and the protests, about the prayer meetings, about the funeral celebrations of life of George. Tragically, we live in a country where a certain amount of racism and distrust and suspicion happens because of the color of a person's skin. It's a horrible fact. But we can all work together to live out the reality that no matter the skin color, each one, everyone, is precious in God's sight. Everyone precious and valuable. And it is our responsibility and it is our privilege to get to know and keep getting to know all of our neighbors. As disciples of Jesus, as his followers, we are Christians who do not dominate anyone. With humility, we admit our brokenness and our human weaknesses. And sometimes with Jesus working in us, we actually do love and care and serve. And all credit to God for that, working in us and through us. And none of that can happen if we have a dominant or dominating attitude. The commission that Jesus gave to us is to love God, to love our neighbors, and to share Jesus with them, that as we are followers and his disciples, that they also might become his disciples. And the authority to do this belongs to Jesus. And Jesus does the conversion work in people's hearts, while we, we can be witnesses in our actions and our words. And we are called to walk humbly in this mission that Jesus commissions to us. A great modern songwriter named Jason Gray wrote these words just a few years ago. And that's what I will close this message with. He said, God put a million doors in this world for his love to walk through. And one of those doors is you. Let me say it one more time for you. God put a million doors in this world for his love to walk through. And one of those doors 
is you. To that, all God's people can say, Amen. If you're feeling energetic and like to stand, we're going to sing the next hymn, which is called, Lord, Speak to Us That We May Speak. us good to remind ourselves of the foundation. Lord Jesus, give them daily strength, heal their disease or injury, reassure them that they are loved. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Oh Lord, we thank you that you've taught us what you would have us to believe and do. Help us to keep your word daily in our hearts so that we may be strengthened in faith and have your holiness in our lives and have your comfort of peace in this life and unto our death. To that all God's people can say, Amen. If you didn't notice the offering containers on your way in, you can see them on your way out. They are uh, black and white plaid boxes on two stands in the back. We'll continue on. Sisters and brothers, it's important to properly prepare and understand Holy Communion, and we say together, Holy Communion is the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, received in and under the earthly elements and instituted by Christ himself. The benefit of Holy Communion is pointed out in Christ's words, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Through these words, the forgiveness of sin, life and salvation are given to us in the sacrament. For where there is forgiveness of sin, there is also reconciliation with God and with one another. Let us all come near to God and confess our sin and ask for forgiveness in the name of Jesus. The Lord is merciful and will keep his promise to forgive our sin. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, I confess my sins, known and unknown, and my decisions to not follow where you are leading me. I believe that without your mercy I am lost. Please wash away all my sins. I ask for your forgiveness. Hear the very, very good news that Jesus forgives you. God sent Jesus to us and his plan was fulfilled when Jesus died on the cross. And then he conquered death. That paid the price for all our sins, giving those who believe in him everlasting life. And Jesus even continues to call those who not, do not yet believe in him, to turn to him, repent, and believe while there is still time. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. When you eat this, remember all that I've done for you. And then again, after supper, he took the cup of wine, gave thanks, and gave it for all the people to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. 
He said, when you drink this, remember all that I have done for you. I invite us to pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. And Larry and I are going to do the distribution. We're going to wear masks, and we're going to hand sanitize, and then we're going to come out to you and distribute these little self-contained cups that have both the bread wafer and the wine. And invite you to kind of, there's a top little plastic layer to kind of get that open for the bread and be ready for that, but don't eat yet. We're going to eat together as the family of God. Now, there we go. Let's share this holy meal together, which gives us those great gifts of forgiveness of sins and life and salvation. Share in the body of Christ. Share in the blood of Christ. Some of you have a pocket. <laughs> and if you got a drop in there and you're worried about whether that would get in your pocket, just give it back to the earth. That's fine. Um, there is a garbage can up in the corner. And we can throw our little cups away afterwards. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you, keep you in God's grace, now, today, and into everlasting life. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It has been great to worship together. We have one final hymn to sing. I'm thinking that I will come to the back and I will greet people without shaking of hands. But... Some of you might want to hang around. We don't have any coffee or any of those cookies or things afterwards, but you can hang out and visit with each other. That will be fine, you know, being careful, whatever is appropriate for you and whatever you kind of agree with the person you're talking to, how close to stand, whatever works. Let's sing this final hymn. It is an Easter hymn. It's called Thine is the Glory.
and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.